All right, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for being patient as our number of attendees uh, was climbing. I think we're five minutes past seven, so ready to get going. And that number has almost doubled since seven o'clock. So I think that's a good sign. Uh, welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll try to, again, limit our time to an hour tonight, but I'll give some information, present a lot of it you've heard before uh, and some of it's new. Uh, and then we will, um, do some question and answer. We've expanded our group a little bit tonight. So we have members of our of our senior team, uh, you know, Mr. Doyon, Ms. Viana, Mr. Bala, who'll join us at the end uh, tonight. But we've also asked um, Elise Lewis, nurse practitioner, director of health services here on campus to join, as well as uh, Dr. Michael Mutchler, who is uh, medical director uh, on campus and longtime school physician, as well as um, a couple members of our task force. So you'll again see Dr. Ho and Dr. Hermos uh, come on at the end. But uh, I thought I would give uh, a little bit of time, presentation, stick to our usual format, and then bring on others for the second half uh, to be panelists and hopefully answer your questions and, and go from there. Um, so just I want to welcome everyone again, sort of keeping the Penguins Home Task Force. Uh, we're uh, just about completing four weeks here on campus since we arrived in late January and about to start our final three weeks next week coming into uh, our time before the spring break. And those are some things I'll talk about tonight, spring break and, and other uh, programs that we've done at school. But first, just a, a little bit of an update. I usually present some uh, public health information, and, and this is yesterday when I was putting this together this afternoon, the numbers weren't quite released and they're similar to what they were. I saw them right before coming on tonight, um, yesterday, but uh, certainly that number of uh, 1788 cases has come down. And if you've seen these presentations before, you, you know that the format of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, their reporting format has changed a little bit. So if you're not familiar, uh, the confirmed cases is now up here sort of on the upper left-hand side of the screen and it, it shows more information. You can go to the website and um, as you can see on the left-hand side, there are other tabs with trends, cases, testing, and I believe they also give some vaccine information as well. So pretty interesting there, something we're closely following. Uh, that number has decreased recently, um, uh, but of course we are continuing, continuing to monitor that, but uh, good trends at least so far. Uh, similarly, uh, just a, a few days ago, COVID Act Now, which is a resource that we've used and that I've reported on in the past, uh, put an alert, sort of bringing their uh, alert level down, which is good news. We've been at the active outbreak and they actually didn't have that severe, sort of the dark red, you can see there in the middle of the screen level until um, cases got uh, pretty high in the December, January time and actually created that uh, other level. Uh, which we were at for a while, came down into the red. And now good news, again, another another positive trend uh, coming into the orange period there as well. So um, another piece of information, another data point that we're using uh, when we're looking at the overall uh, state of public health in the area around us. And, and similarly looking, speaking of the areas around us, uh, looking at Massachusetts, last time when I presented this uh, picture with the towns, it was mostly red, particularly on the eastern part of the state where you see mostly yellow now. Um, you know, still some some areas of red, particularly uh, in the southeast there, but again, uh, another trend that's, that's showing in the right direction. So you know, we feel pretty good about, um, you know, delaying our onboarding a, a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of schools were onboarding in the middle of January, even early January, and that um, late January, first day of classes, early February to still have a spring break has uh, sort of synced us nicely with the decreasing um, case count. So we're, we're happy about that, but continuing to monitor, particularly with news of variants, mutations, um, and things like that. Uh, another tool which I've, I've spoken about in the past, the, the outbreak detection tool, which is um, sponsored by Mass General, Harvard, Georgia Tech, and, and the Boston Medical Center. Um, again, last last time when I presented in January, about uh, I guess a little over a month ago, maybe five five and a half weeks ago, six weeks ago, uh, this doubling time was in the sort of you know orange, uh, maybe sort of dark orange to orange, the two to three to three to four week range. As you can see, this is all in the in the more than six week range, uh, which is another uh, good data point. 
as we're, as we're looking at the public health situation on campus though, we continue to have our planning committees looking at student experience, regularly meeting about academics, athletics, student affairs, residential life, extracurriculars, which, which have been busy, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, certainly admissions and what that means for the school uh, into the spring and then going into next year, uh, campus operations, facilities, food service, trying to get creative there, um, health and wellness, uh, communications, you know, events like tonight, uh, and, and the letters that we're sending and will continue to send, uh, for example, about spring break, which I'll talk about. And then we just completed our winterum with our exposition last week. I thought that was a uh, very successful and a really uh, great chance to have some cross disciplinary work focused on justice, belonging uh, and inclusion. Uh, that, that was a nice value add for our students this year. And, and I will say, you know, given that we started uh, August 24th, right? And went to that November 20th and then added these 12 weeks of winter and then going in, it's, it's a much longer school year uh, by a few weeks than we typically would have, uh, but breaking it up with that winter room with those seminar offerings uh, was a nice um, sort of additional layer to give our students uh, an experience while be, some of that was online uh, to be able to, to start um, in that virtual format, come back to campus and have a culminating experience uh, with an exposition last week. And I know that particular effort of Winterum was a, was a heavy lift for faculty, um, offering additional programs, courses not taught before. Um, there was a lot of collaboration uh, across departments. So really proud of, of our efforts there and, and our outcomes. Um, spring semester, as you can see, we've gotten some activities in. You see some of our music groups there, uh, you know, the empty, Ice Arena with the, with the game from last weekend. Uh, similarly, you don't see the stands in the basketball game, but that was a purple and white scrimmage from last week. Uh, so there are some activities and, and uh, a trend towards resuming uh, sort of the normal programming that we have in addition to what happens in the classroom. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about quarantine and, and um, clarify some, and, and we can also talk to the medical folks on the call at the end um, some assumptions here um, and, you know, want to have a chance to answer questions about it. But certainly, you know, when we do quarantine, if you're a close contact of a positive, uh, which we, you know, unfortunately had to deal with at the beginning of, of the uh, onboarding process, um, we go through a contact trace, determine who a close contact is, and then follow the CDC recommendation for a quarantine period of 14 days. Um, and, and that you know, was the C CDC's only guideline when we started um, or began uh, the pandemic um, earlier last year. And, and that has evolved um, based on, and I put a lot of language here and you, you don't have to read it all. I mean, this is certainly being uh, recorded. It'll be posted on our uh, COVID webpage with all of the other webinars that we've done. But based on circumstances and resources, there were also other acceptable options for the general population. Um, you know, which is which quarantine can end after 10 days, right? But there is a transmission risk uh, estimated to be about one to 10%. Uh, and we've certainly seen in our own experience some late um, positives, uh, you know, not only on but off campus. And so that's something that we want to be really careful of, particularly in a congregate living environment where there's a lot of crossover, um, even though we're trying to limit that crossover and mitigate interaction. Um, it's, it's, not, it's almost impossible to limit all of it. So uh, one of the things we can limit is those entries uh, between day 10 and 14, which is why we do that 14 day quarantine period. Um, and then some folks have asked me questions about seven days. And again, um, it can end after seven days if tests are negative. Again, five to 12% chance uh, after day seven of, of, of sort of converting to a positive, if you would, from somebody who's previously uh, tested negative. And then in all of those cases, um, you know, there has to be strict adherence to uh, quarantine and uh, non-pharmaceutical -pharma interventions, right? Like the mask wearing, hand washing, uh, very strict uh, to those um, strategies. And, and while we're trying to be strict on those at all times, uh, I really don't wanna take sort of a should be okay type of approach uh, to that when you're looking at one to 10%, five to 12%. Uh, especially in a congregate living environment where everybody else's experience is based on um, other members of the community adhering to our rules. 
Uh, and so one of the things that we can control in this is that quarantine period and limiting that risk of that one to 10%, five to 12%. So I hope that's clear. If it's not, I did put a resource there. You can see this on the CDC. This language is pretty much taken directly from there. Uh, and I know our, our medical staff would be happy to probably add on to that um, as well. So I just wanted to clarify that and explain a little bit about that process. Um, going forward, also another clarification point, uh, discussion point. I did talk about spring break at our, our webinar in January and that, you know, when we looked at adjusting the schedule, if you remember when we put out our initial schedule, it was um, sort of the fall semester that we had with the winter uh, and then a, uh, not a resumption of classes uh, really until the beginning of March. Uh, and then another 14 week period of, of in-person learning. And one of the justifications, reasons, uh, and based on a lot of the feedback that we got from our families and our students was that that 13 weeks that we did in the fall, 14 that we were looking towards in the spring was just a really long time without being able to, um, you know, get off campus, go home, visit with families. Um, take a break, that sort of thing. And so we were looking for uh, sort of a middle ground where we could still delay our start of school, which you know I just spoke about because of uh, predicted cases during the December, January time. So we landed at you know, early February, late January, um, but still allowing for the 14 weeks broken into two chunks with a spring break. And, and how we're handling that spring break uh, really needs to be focused on. It needs to be something that we're uh, conscious of, I guess, maybe a better way to say it, uh, because it, it is a risk of people coming to and from campus and, and how we're going to deal with that. So I want to talk a little bit about that tonight, answer questions. You'll be getting in something in writing next week. Uh, but, you know, spring break does start on March 19th, and we are going to onboard um, April 1st and 2nd. So that gives you about 12 days uh, to be off campus and, and really seeing that more as a break and not um, sort of break in the, in the literal sense, not the typical spring break definition of like a vacation or having all these contacts, but really a way to um, sort of break up the 14 weeks on campus into two smaller chunks and being able to um, be with, with family during that time. Um, so we're gonna ask, actually very similar to what we did last year when we sent everybody home for spring break um, at the beginning of the pandemic where we asked for your spring break plans to be communicated to the school, similar to what we did at the beginning of um, the summer leading into onboarding in the fall, knowing where, where folks would be quarantining. Uh, so that information or request will, will go out next week, uh, collecting not only information for departure uh, as, as uh, we typically do, but also a quarantine location and a sign up for return. Um, and then similar to how we've onboarded in the past with our arrival process, the COVID test will be required prior to coming onto campus. It looks like we're gonna do 72 hours. Uh, and again, that will be communicated in writing, but just to um, give you some warning about that. And then similar pause until results are received. And, and really we wanna see, depending on public health situation, um, how we're gonna move forward after that. Hopefully cases continue to trend down, but you know we can't predict it. Um, and, and that we're able to just uh, do what we did, uh, not only just a, six weeks ago, but also in the fall, some kind of quiet period, and then move directly into um, the beginning of our dinner switch and coming into um, campus life. Um, we're asking everyone to please, please adhere to CDC guidelines, of course, Massachusetts and other states that you may visit, um, travel rules, and and you know, visit maybe isn't the right word, but other states that you may visit because you're going home um, and, and adhere to the penguin promise at all times. You know, of course, wear masks, which is wear masks, maintain appropriate physical distance, wash hands, avoid large groups. Um, but again, similar to how we came into campus the last two times, we requested all families limit contacts to really members of their own immediate family for the overall health of the Cushing community and only expand that when necessary in traveling to and from campus. And, you know, due to the length of the break, a COVID exposure at any time during that period, uh, but particularly as it, it gets closer uh, to the onboarding can result in onset of symptoms um, or positive screening after a return to campus, right? Um, so, and that really does put the 
sort of last six or seven weeks into Jeopardy when seniors are here, when we're trying to celebrate that class, when we're having those rites of passage and ceremonies that we're, you know, going to maintain and, and still carry out. Uh, so we really are asking our entire community of um, not only seniors, but uh, the rest of our uh, students to adhere to the Penguin Promise and uh, live in that semi-quarantine environment, uh, but still get the break of being able to see family at the same time. Um, and then arrival, as I, as I just said, it will be very similar to August and January. Uh, there'll be a sign up, uh, take a test on arrival, and then, and then go into that pause. So hopefully there's, there's no um, sort of confusion there or um, you know, everybody knows what to expect. Uh, we've done it before and I, and I think we'll be able to do it, do it forward a uh, third time around. Uh, hopefully it will be an even smoother process. I know the student experience team, uh, Ms. Pollock, Mr. Doyon, Dr. Willis, Mr. Bala, Ms. Viana, uh, are really are meeting hours and hours, uh, both in the summer, fall and continuing on. And one of the big pieces they focus on is to be sure there is a smooth arrival process that we're working with dorm staff, faculty and everyone else to get students safely to campus. Um, and then pre-arrival testing. So uh, tentative end of the quiet period based on results. Again, you know, we, uh, anticipate no more than a 48 hour period for results, uh, but you know, that is never a hundred percent. So we wanna uh, have a tentative end to that quiet phase, which is that Sunday, uh, Monday the 5th would be our first day of class and then do a surveillance test pretty quick, a hundred percent of the population, which is all um, students and employees. Uh, and then same thing on the 14th as well. Um, we're going to ask for safety safety app to be continued for all employees and students throughout the remainder of the school year. Uh, so another important piece of our uh, surveillance in, in keeping the, the campus safe and allowing us to do uh, the activities and um, sports and everything else that students love in addition to that face-to-face -face learning. Um, I included this uh, last time because I had had it uh, in the uh, I think it was the webinar in December uh, and then in January there were lots of questions and I, and I didn't have it so I'm not I don't need to go over it but someone had asked um, you know about uh, vaccine and if it was approved for age groups and so this you know did ha does have the highlights uh, and it is from from that time so I don't know I don't think anything's changed I just looked at this today but I think Dr. Amos Mutchler and, and um, Elise and, and Dr. Hohen can fill in some of the details. I know Johnson & Johnson uh, could be approved, I think as early as tomorrow, last I read. Uh, and Pfizer is the uh, one that's recommended for 16 plus, Moderna 18 plus. Um, so, you know, last time we had some questions on the particular um, vaccines and, uh, you know, efficacy rates and pieces like that. So I thought I would throw this back up there just to um, add it to the conversation. Um, and again, with the medical team here tonight is the perfect group. If you did have questions about it, uh, maybe this would, uh, someone who was participating last time, you'd remember uh, what it was, or if you have additional questions, it could be certainly something that we dialogue about tonight. Athletics. So usually on these webinars, lots of questions about athletics, lots of excitement, which is great. Cushing has a, a rich history of athletic excellence, and certainly we want to uh, grow, maintain, and preserve that. Um, as we move forward. Uh, so just want to talk a little bit uh, about what we're doing in, in that area. And Ms. Viana can talk about that. We do have games scheduled most weekends uh, in the winter and also working on the spring. And, you know, that's contingent on uh, negative tests, not only at Cushing, but our opposing school. Uh, we were able to play games last weekend against Williston Northampton. Um, and then because this week we've had uh, successful testing results. You know, we did have a school on the schedule that unfortunately uh, they did have to cancel uh, and are unable to play. Uh, and then we got a second school to play and that also uh, got changed. So now, you know, it's, it's scrambling and all schools are doing it. Uh, so we're hoping to still have those, but there's going to have to be um, flexibility, which I know we've asked for everyone for last minute cancellations, change of opponents, but we really do want to try to get these in. I think they're important. I think, uh, you know, the kids have really 
uh, waited a long time and, and it's something that brings our, our community together, even if we can't be there as fans, but join a, a, in live stream or uh, however method we can. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. And I know Ms. Viana will talk a little bit more. We of course can do our purple and white inner squad scrimmages uh, like we did in the fall. Uh, and I know that's a, another option as well. We do do as part of our process and agreement with other schools, uh, not only our weekly surveillance testing, but also rapid testing prior to the games for all athletes and coaches um, and officials uh, are tested as well as bus drivers um, prior to game day. So there's, uh, we're really trying to uh, mitigate every chance of exposure. Uh, there are no fans, but live stream is available uh, for most of those games. Certainly all the ones that are played at Cushing do have live stream where you can watch them online. Um, you know, our, our opponent, most of them have it, but if, if we're at a, uh, an away game and they don't, it's out of our control, but certainly when our teams are here on the Cushing campus, we do have live streams set up and have added some to different areas. So no matter what facility they're playing in, um, Heslin, the Watkins Field House, or, or up at the rink, um, that will be available. Uh, as I said before, planning for a spring season is underway. Uh, a lot more schools seeing that a few of us are playing in the winter have really um, made the decision to at least move forward with scheduling for the spring. So we're excited about that. Um, and if, if you're wondering when those are, you can always see the Cushing website. Those athletic schedules are updated and it's a new website. It was just updated last week. So if you haven't seen that, go take a look. Um, and you can check out not only the athletic schedule, but all that we have up there. Um, just want to review, usually at the end of these presentations, I talk about a timeline going forward. So February 25th today, we have our uh, second webinar of 2021, and we've done probably close to 20 of these since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, several all school um, sort of bring the penguins home. I think those alone, we've done uh, 12 uh, since May and, and many uh, for different groups such as international or, or day students or domestic students throughout that as well in addition to these and then some before that uh, on, on our plans for you know um, remote learning when we had to switch to that in the spring. So I think the cadence of these webinars every few weeks is, is uh, important and probably expected. Uh, by a lot of our families. Another method of communication will continue to send letters, but I think hearing from us an hour every few weeks, um, you know, for the rest of the school year, a couple more times would also be helpful in, in uh, getting our message out there for expectations and how we're continuing to meet the challenge of, of COVID-19 while also delivering in-person programming. Um, so we'll continue to do that. You see April 15th, uh, I plan to do our third one. In between that, we have our spring break beginning, as I said earlier, on March 19th. Uh, please stay in that semi-quarantine, limiting uh, exposure to your immediate family during that time, and then student arrival on campus um, on April 1st and 2nd for that final seven-week stretch um, of, the, of the school year. So looking forward to celebrating the end of the year together as a community, getting through it, celebrating the class of 2021 in this uh, most unusual school year. Um, and, you know, again, we started with this and I, and I haven't changed it since the beginning. Opening isn't going to be events, it's gonna be a process. And I think although we've gone way past opening at this, this point, uh, we are still continuing to onboard, you know, bring the community together um, as one Cushing student body, faculty, employees, uh, several times over the course of the school year. So it feels like we're reopening, which is good news, uh, and hope to continue to do that uh, one more time after spring break as we are in the home stretch of the school year. So uh, I will ask all of our panelists to um, turn on their cameras, and then we will turn it over to our attendees for um, some question and answer. Um, and go from there. We'll wait for everyone else to join. So a few. Um, since we have a bigger group, I don't want to take too much time, but maybe, uh, especially since some haven't been with us for a, a few a few months, even though working hard behind the scenes with our task force, maybe just quickly introduce yourself. Talk. It's, give a, a few sentences uh, about your work or involvement with Cushing and, and then pass it to the next person. Um, 
Dr. Hohen, do you want to start your first on my <laughs> first Sure. Time? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm so um, delighted to be here and thank you. Um, thank you for this great presentation, Dr. Burton. Um, I'm Annie Hohen and I'm an associate professor of epidemiology at Dartmouth College, the medical school there. And I've been um, on the task force since the summer when it when it started. And uh, I've just really um, enjoyed working with this group and helping to contribute to the planning at Cushing. So um, I'm also on the, I wanted to mention, I'm also on the task force at Dartmouth. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mutchler? Yes, hi, thanks, uh, Randy. Um, so I'm Dr. Michael Mutchler. I'm, I'm a uh, board certified adolescent and family uh, medicine physician. Uh, my main office is in Gardner, Mass, where I'm in practice with my wife. And I've been with Cushing now for almost 25 years. Uh, my wife's grandfather was a class of 1910 at Cushing. I've had two uh, children go to Cushing and uh, been uh, also in addition to there on campus in the health center have been with teams working with uh, prior football team and, and hockey teams as well. And uh, certainly been on task force for this year. It's interesting as we're thinking about spring coming up of how fast this has gone and uh, it's gonna be done before we know it. So happy to be here. Great, uh, Dr. Ramos. Hi, I am Tina Hermos. I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor um, down at UMass Children's Medical Center in Worcester, which is about um, half an hour uh, south of Cushing, um, and was excited to join this task force at the beginning of the school year, well, actually over the summer. Um, so glad to be here. Um, and many of you know Elise Lewis, um, certainly in communication probably regularly, uh, but at least you want to say hello. Sure. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm Elise Lewis. I'm a board certified family nurse practitioner and the director of health services. And as Randy mentioned, um, we're usually in communication often. Um, and thanks for coming tonight. Great. And then I think everyone knows uh, Mr. Doyon, Ms. Viana, uh, Mr. Bala, right? Mr. Doyon is director of student affairs, Ms. Viana is director of athletics, and Mr. Bala, academic affairs. So I will get right to the questions uh first one right off the bat what is the plan for graduation so we are <laughs> planning for uh, an in-person outdoor event uh if possible and allowed uh, by the state of massachusetts uh, our calendar if if you remember we sort of flipped it so originally um or usually uh what happens is everyone's on campus um, our senior class graduates and then there's a uh, period of finals where the under class uh, classes stay. Uh, we flip that around to do um, underclass sleep first and then just have the senior class on campus. That way we're minimizing the number of uh, students on campus, the number of individuals who will be at the graduation ceremony. We're looking at how do we limit the size, maybe two individuals per student or one individual per student, depending on what Massachusetts allows. Uh, but we are planning for uh, in person and then streaming it for our families that are unable to attend. So that's that's our plan as of now. Um, next question. If cases continue to drop, would fans be allowed to attend spring games if they were outside and cases are on the decline? If not, if parents are vaccinated, would that change the policy? Dr. Mutchler, do you want to take a crack at that? Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, we have to look at, at what the uh, Department of Public Health and, and Massachusetts regulations are with that. But obviously, if, if things continue to decline, I would anticipate that um, there would be some um, thoughts in terms of being able to allow for people to attend at, at certain numbers with risk mitigated strategies. You know, we certainly know that vaccines are going to be potentially helpful, but we don't know yet what that might mean when the potential variants come on board. We certainly know it's going to take a while for everyone to get vaccinated. So we still need to be aware of the fact that even though we may be vaccinated, it's possible that we ourselves may harbor the virus and give it to someone who hasn't. So we certainly need to make sure that that uh, even though vaccines are going to be present, that it's not going to mean that we can um, gather and be shoulder to shoulder and go back to how we used to be. So we'll have to monitor it. But I would certainly see if the trend goes in the right direction, that'd be hopeful we could have more attendees and and be able to enjoy things on some level like we did before. So 
as we say, it's time will tell. Great, thank you. Um, question in here, I think Dr. Hohen, maybe best for you. Um, do you anticipate variants changing uh, what we're doing at Cushing? Let me unmute myself. Um, I think that that's, I mean, I, I think we would probably all agree that's really an open question at this point. I think even at the, you know, national and international levels, we don't, we don't know what these variants are going to mean as far as cases um, and hospitalizations over the next few weeks. If you're watching the epidemic curves, there, you'll, it's striking. They're on a very steep decline. And, um, we see that at the local level level where I am, and you're, I'm sure you're seeing that in Massachusetts as well. It's it's kind of um, it's very heartening, but uh, the variants are kind of the big unknown at this point. A lot of experts are predicting a fourth wave and um, happening in the spring, like in the next starting in the next month or so. Um, whether that will materialize, I think, is you know anybody's guess, but that's what I'm seeing a lot of experts predicting. Um, it'll it should be mitigated by the vaccination that's you know happening now, but it won't be completely because we don't have we don't have the majority of the population vaccinated, and it's just going to take time. Um, I will tell you that at Dartmouth we were doing great. Um, we've been doing great, keeping case cases down on campus. Um, and then overnight last night, we had 37 case, we went from one case to 37 cases. And it it's a significant proportion of our community. And it really um, illustrated for me how quickly this virus can spread in a, you know, small tight knit community, um, like in a in a residential school. So I think we just, you know, we have to keep our guard up and um, be careful. I think that, you know, it's really wise to consider very, um, you know, in a measured way, things like outdoor graduation ceremonies and sports, um, even with spectators, it's, it's not a bad idea, but, um, but we just have to be careful about, about it. And we have very in-depth discussions every week about, you know, even these nitty gritty details, um, so uh, I think, you know, it's just, it's unknown right now what these variants mean, but um, we're, you know, we're all watching it very carefully. And um, I think we're just gonna have to wait and see. Great. Anyone else wanna add to that? All right. Um, Mr. Doyon, question for you. Will students be required to pack up their rooms again before spring break? Um, uh, at this point, we're not anticipating that students would have to pack up their rooms. Um, but, but if that were to change, we, we were, we would be sure to communicate that out. Um, you know, I think, I think as we just heard from, uh, you know, Dr. Hohen, you know, as, you know, as things continue to trend in this, uh, and, you know, in our current ways, you know, I think that we are hopeful for, for, for what the future holds, but, um, you know, we're also understanding we're close to a year into this experience now and, and, and also very, aware that things could change very quickly. So um, at this point, no, but um, if that were to change, you know, we, you know, we were, we do have plans to modify very quickly. Great, thank you. Um, Elise, I'll give this one to you. Is there any possibility of 16 plus students being vaccinated if it becomes available to that age group? Um, yes, I mean, we, have been exploring different options for vaccinations. Um, I know in the um, fall, if you all remember, we partnered with CVS um, and I'll continue to explore those options. And when it becomes available, I'll most certainly let everyone know and we will um, get that going. Great, thank you. Uh, and there's a follow-up question. Maybe Dr. Ermos, you have the answer to this or, or any of the other uh, medical experts on the call. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is that okay for kids? Well, the, the um, emergency use authorization that's about to go through is not going to include kids, um, but there's no reason to believe like the mechanism of any of these vaccines that they shouldn't work in kids. And in fact, um, we're finding with natural infection that kids are producing really strong immune system, immune responses um, stronger than adults. So 
Um, I think all these vaccines are going to be safe and effective in kids when they when they get to the trials. And the trials are going to be um, for the trials in kids are going to look at um, immune response. They're not going to wait to see how many kids get infected versus how many kids are protected. They're just going to uh, measure the immune response and correlate those numbers to what we know is protective. So it won't the trials in kids won't take as long as the adult trials. Is that because I'm just curious because the COVID isn't as um, likely to be a severe case in kids? No, I just think they don't need to. <laughs> um, so they're really, it's really just they're gonna they're just gonna extrapolate. Like if your titers reach a certain amount, then you're protected because we know that in adults. Um, and then it's gonna be safety and dosing studies in kids. Um, so that you're not gonna have to wait for a certain number of kids to get infected to compare the control um, and the intervention groups the way they did with the adults. Thank you. Um, Ms. Viana, question for you. How do you envision spring sports and activities? Well, hopefully it'll be based on what we did last weekend, which is we were able to get some games in, which was just incredible. Um, we're, we're planning, we're very actively planning for the spring for athletics and for afternoon activities. I think, you know, we're sort of bound by what happens with the health situation, but we are planning on playing and um, we hope to return to sports right after, I saw another question in there, so I'll kind of go into that. Um, returning from spring break and we go into quarantine as soon as we are, um, the test results get back and we start athletics up right away, we would look to have tryouts at that period. So the very first week of April and we'll practice as long as we need to before we're allowed to compete in games. So the, the season may be shortened a bit, um, but we are very actively trying to schedule games, um, certainly on the weekends. Um, Mr. Dion, uh, or Elise actually in this one, for students who did not return in January uh, for in-person and are looking to return after spring break, who do they contact? How does, it, does that start with you, Josh, and then go to Elise to go through the process or how would you prefer that to work? Um, do you mind, Josh? <laughs> um, Mr. Doyon tend to work as a team in this because there's multiple moving parts. So if you send an email and you CC both of us, you will get a response and um, we will work through that process because there's the health side of things and there's the student affairs. And um, like I said, we work as a team to get your child back on campus. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bala, question for you. What is the status of AP tests in May? I was hoping you were going to pick that one, Randy. <laughs> the college board in early February just released sort of their um, current expectations about uh, an updated timeline, which includes three different administration dates and a combination of formats for both in person and um, and digital. Um, so they are once again proving to to be responsive and, and flexible. Um, Dr. Willis, as our AP coordinator, is working out the, the details for what the specifics will look like at, at Cushing. And then uh, between her and your AP teachers, we'll be able to, as, as the College Board continues to hone their strategy, we'll be able to communicate all of those, those details. But they are approaching soon, and, and we are definitely um, all making progress towards those larger goals. So thank you for that question. Sure, no problem. Um, Ms. Viana, question for you. Will we, after the winter season, will um, sort of off-season teams still be able to use facilities? For example, um, skaters using the rink, hockey players using the rink, basketball players using the courts, those sorts of things. Yes. We so, yeah. So they would be open for open gym or open ice time, which we schedule and we send that out through email. Um, and then the NEPSAC allows the teams to be able to to practice out of season with their coaches. So there might be some time for that, whether it's a couple days a week, um, but they will all, all of our athletes, our students will be in afternoon activity. So that would be sort of during the afternoon and perhaps a couple times sprinkled in, in the evenings. But open gym and open ice are generally open during the day. Great, thank you. Um, another question about graduation and this is, one, we don't have the answer to it right now. Uh, for the benefit of families living abroad, when would we know the number of family members to invite for graduation? Um, and the date, well, certainly the date has been released. It's May 22nd. 
uh, that uh, is not going to change. So you, you can plan on that. Number of uh, family members and, and people to be invited could change <laughs> right up until, um, you know, a few days before, depending on state requirements. Um, so uh, I anticipate, you know, one or two, hopefully, and, and do it in a socially, physically distanced way. Uh, but again, that's tough to predict this far out. And as we get closer, hopefully we can see some of the trends play out. And if, you know, there's uh, predictions of a fourth wave, as Dr. Ho had mentioned, if that happens, if it doesn't happen, I, that would, I would imagine certainly impact that, uh, but we'll continue to, and, and certainly the school will continue to advocate for uh, as, as much of a normal process as possible going into the school year, which somebody else asked about prom, uh, similar. Uh, you know, we did our um, schedule the way we did to have um, our underclasses leave and then keep the seniors here to be able to try to do those types of events with less people. Um, so depending what we're able to do, we really want to try to do as much as possible. Um, can kids have roommates when they come back from spring break, Mr. Doyon? Um, yes, uh, we currently have roommates now and that is something we are looking to, uh, you know, continue after spring break and uh, much like, um, you know, Miss Lewis had said earlier, if, if, if you are not, if you are considering returning to campus after spring break and you are interested in having a roommate, um, you know, we just ask you to please reach out as soon as you can so we can start that process um, um, to make sure we're just uh, aware and, you know, can, uh, can meet requests uh, when you are able to do so. Great. Thank you. Um, question. Um, that we got ahead of time a lot and that I tried to address uh, in the presentation, but I, I'd love just comment from the, from the medical team on about quarantine. So there's been sort of lots of uh, conversation about that uh, and CDC guidelines and, and why it's necessary uh, to have those 14 days based on some of the um, conversions that happen late. I don't know if Dr. Marshall, you want to start and then you're um, <laughs> Yeah, so when you look at the when you look at the different uh, quarantine options that have been set up, I think that has been geared towards different workplace situations and just, you know, community and society situations. I think when you're looking at a congregate school setting uh, and dealing with adolescence and adolescent behavior, um, I think that across the board that the recommendation would be to go the full 14 days uh, to certainly um, minimize risk but also to, to account for the fact that we do have late incubators. And our experience uh, was that when we came back and we did have a situation and it did result in some quarantine situations of people leaving. And so I think, again, if we wanna to try to keep the school open, functioning, allow people to enjoy it uh, in the best of circumstances as we can, I think that as an academy, we do have to certainly look at can you best minimize that risk versus saying, well, let's, do this and let's hope something doesn't happen. I think, you know, let's let's play it safe. And for that reason, the 14 days would be certainly advised any Congress setting, which is not a typical and customary workplace where people go home and come back and can, you know, have space in their office building or things of that nature, or essential workers of people who are taking care of people in the healthcare settings, things of that nature. So that's that's my thought. Those are my thoughts. Dr. Aramos, is there data on sort of the um, difference with adolescents and, and how long it does take, or is it is it not uh, different than with adults? Um, I haven't seen anything about adolescents um, developing symptoms with a longer incubation period than adults, but we know that kids are more often asymptomatic carriers than adults. So I would say that, um, you know, we're doing, we're doing almost like a, a double of what the CDC is recommending, but I, I think the parents would be happy about that because it's protecting all the other kids. Whereas, you know, the CDC, again, in the non-congregate living situation is allowing early break from quarantine with testing, um, but we're recommending the full 14 days of quarantine um, you know, which is it, with the, in the real world, you can do that without testing plus the testing. And I think that's appropriate in this situation from what Dr. Mutchler said, and also because we have young people who are more likely to be asymptomatic carriers. So 
even if they don't develop symptoms on day 13, they could be asymptomatic carriers on day 13. And the way um, the Cushing model will pick up those as well, because they can certainly be contagious to others. Um, so I think it's the best, the best way in this situation, given congregate living and adolescence. I saw you turn off your mic, Annie, so I didn't know if you were going <laughs> to. Oh, I, I was, as, as, as Dr. Aramos was saying that, I'm, I'm just thinking about those percentages that you shared um, at the beginning, um, Dr. Burton, about uh, the, ch the, the chances of missing a positive if you let somebody out of quarantine early. And it occurred to me that those those, you know, that's based on data. It's based on observational data that uh, is, is based on the general population of people of all ages, presumably. And so I think what Dr. Ermos said about this being a population largely of adolescents, um, if you did that study that came up with those percentages on a group of young people, you would probably get different answers because they are so much more likely to be asymptomatic. Um, so, you know, that, that assumes that you're monitoring symptoms every day and, and teenagers are just not as likely to ever have symptoms. So I think that those estimates are very, uh, are probably at the low end for this population. That's another, that's another reason to, to do the full quarantine. That's all just a nerdy, <laughs> nerdy thought I was having. And just to be clear that the CDC options for shorter quarantines they, you still have to do all the mitigation until day 14. So even if you're quote unquote released from quarantine, so you can go to work, you're still going to work and distancing and masking um, and the type of things that aren't possible if you're living in a dorm. Well, <laughs> they, are, they are possible, but difficult, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I know at least, you know, having been on the sort of the front lines of a lot of this, you've seen that they're, just uh, is a lot of contact in a boarding school, right? And certainly that quarantine does does uh, try to break that transmission cycle, I guess. Yeah, and the, um, the only piece I was gonna add to the conversation was that, you know, I regularly communicate with our contact in the Neshoba Department of Health and me and her oh, time and time again, every time we speak, talk about these late incubators in day 12, day 13, and then turning positive. So I think that just really brings, you know, that 14 day light, you know, to light even more so. Great, thank you. Um, is there any sort of shifting gears, <laughs> Ms. Ms. Viana, and I can help answer this. Is there any chance of student body attending sports events? So in the winter, that's tough because they're indoor sport events in closed spaces. Uh, but Jen, in the fall, uh, students who were on campus, uh, you know, we did mark areas in the bleachers that were apart and, and we did have fans at those events, correct? We did. Um, we definitely had them spaced out and then either I or uh, Ryan, our associate AD, would go through with my Ghostbuster backpack and spray things down um, for the benches as well. So yeah, we did, just not inside. We, in fact, we moved one of our volleyball games outside onto the turf for senior day, and we had fans there, so that was kind of cool. That's right. Exactly. Um, Mr. Bala, question for you. Uh, see that about the SAT. So do you anticipate SAT requirements for this year's junior class to be waived for their college admissions process? Um, so that's a, a slightly, I, I think the, the question needs to be sort of shifted around in terms of the, the perspective. It's, it's really up to um, individual colleges as to what their requirements are. And so many have already announced that they continue to, to be flexible with what they're um, expecting of students. And I think that as we saw last year, that will continue to evolve as students are able to, um, to test and what test centers are available. And um, if any individual student, especially within the junior class has questions about what, what that might look like, um, I would certainly encourage you to, to reach out to your college counselor direct, directly, um, especially as you're thinking about how your list of schools um, is also starting to take shape and, and to begin to get a sense of what those testing requirements were like this year. And, and again, to be able to start to think about what a strategy might look like um, 
for the spring um, and then in, into, into the fall as well. Um, I'll also add once again that we um, at Cushing are, are able to host the SAT on April 27th. Um, so for those students that are on campus, we are, are doing what we can to provide that opportunity. But uh, again, um, the actual decision is really up to, to colleges um, as they're thinking about um, access and, and equity in their, their applicant pool. And Raj, a follow-up question. Um, the return of the traditional daily class schedule. I think this, this is referring to um, the shift that we had this week after winter. So, um, we have shifted um, as of right as of as of this Monday back to the schedule that we followed in the fall that has a, a two week rotation. Um, so this is week one, which is a purple week, and then next week we'll go into our, our gray week, and then we will follow that till the end of uh, or through spring break. Um, it's our expectation that that will be our schedule for for the remainder of the year, uh, mainly because of the the features that it has built in to help with uh, all the mitig mitigation strategies that the health team has recommended um, revolving around lunch and, and longer passing times and the ability to sanitize classrooms in between. Um, but we have at least given ourselves the opportunity to um, assess how these next four weeks go. And then if there are adjustments that, that we need to make going into that last stretch of, of on-campus learning, um, we've got the the time period of spring break to to consider any tweaks moving forward but as of right now um the schedule from the fall that we are back on now is sort of the, the expected um lead in to the end of the year and final exams great thank you um when will the 21 22 academic calendar be released that will be released before spring break you should see that we'll post it on the website and send it out it's actually pretty much done at this point so expect to see that soon. Um, I can tell you typically we, we begin, last year was a bit of an anomaly where we started in August. Typically we begin first day of class happens on Labor Day uh, and that is the plan for next year, which happens to be late. I believe it's uh, September 6th. Somebody can check me, but I'm pretty sure that's that's what it is. Yeah, all right. Everybody's nodding, so that must be it. Um, Ms. Jen, Ms. question for you. Um, in the winter season, just to clarify, uh, and I think I know the answer to this, but are there now no fans at all across the board at schools we're competing against? Yeah, no, no student fans, no parents, nothing, which is why a lot of the schools are offering live streams. Great, thank you. Um, Elise, there was a question uh, earlier that I saw about the rapid tests for athletics. I think. Uh, folks just were curious about that. Maybe uh, we do do a rapid test now and then are moving to a, a different type of rapid test. Maybe we could chat about that. Yeah. Sure, yeah, so there's a couple rapid tests that have been authorized um, under emergency use since the pandemic started. Um, we initially started with a test by BD um, called the Veritor um, and that one is great. It comes from McKesson, we've been using it, but we actually just signed up and partnered with a couple other schools to get um, Abbott Binax Now cards, um, which are faster for the students, um, a little easier to work with so that we can see more students in a smaller amount of time. Um, so we actually launched our first Binax Now testing today. Um, it went really well. Um, the only complaint I hear about the rapid testing is that I do need to go a little deeper into the nostril to get the result. But I have to say the students handled it like champions, every single one of them. And our adults complained more than the students. So um, all in all, I'd say it went pretty well. Um, and we'll be doing rapid testing um, 24 hours prior to the game day. So we'll do a rapid test for all athletes on Thursdays and then a rapid test for all athletes on Fridays. Um, just in preparation and in addition to that PCR, because that's how other schools are doing it as well. Great. And there's a follow-up question, um, which I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know it. Uh, what is the, for the two tests, is there a difference in the false positive rates for those, for the rapid test? No, not really. No. Um, really with the rapid, rapid tests, you, it's, it's more about frequency. Um, which increases the validity of the test, uh, which is how accurate it is. Um, so between our 
two large school testing dates a week and these extra rapids, um, we're catching a really good picture of what's going on with COVID um, on campus. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and I think is, is one of the advantages of the Binax, you don't need like a machine to process it, right? It's sort of its own. Correct, correct. So I can run multiple tests at once. They take 15 minutes to run, but I can do 20 of them at a time in a 15 minute interval versus the BD Veritor where I actually have a machine and a cassette, um, which just takes much longer. Got it. Thank you. Um, since we're approaching eight o'clock, maybe I'll end with this one because it's more of a discussion uh, type of, uh, of question for the for the medical team, uh, which is, is an ongoing question and has been since the beginning. It says, with the significant decline in cases, will students be allowed um, to have more freedom to socialize among their designated waddles within dorms, et cetera? Will the dimmer switch be lowered soon? So anybody want to start uh, <laughs> that? Uh... Well, I'll just say that, you know, what Dr. Hohn just said, the experts are predicting that we may have another wave. So uh, I guess we have to kind of look at things um on a day-by-day -day basis you know she just outlined what happened at dartmouth overnight and so we have to see what the trend is and um obviously if, if things are favorable then the dimmer switch starts to go down um i wish i could give a solid firm answer uh and see in the future but we will certainly follow the data and adjust the dimmer switch as appropriate second dr Motchler, i know that we've you know, move the dimmer switch up, brought it back, move it up, you know, and that's only in a few short weeks. And I think, you know, Dr. Mutchler, myself and Dr. Burden are in communication almost daily about different requests. Can we do this? Can we do that? Is this safe? Is this not safe? And um, I think the ultimate goal is to have the most normal high school experience while being safe and having risk mitigation practices. Great. Thank you. Um, Time for, looks like there's a couple more here, so I'll, they're pretty quick ones. Hope testing will continue into spring sports. That's our plan, um, you know, as a group of schools that we're competing against. Uh, Jen, I believe that's what we've agreed to, essentially, as we go through the remainder of the school year. That's correct. We won't play anyone who doesn't meet our testing protocols. Great. Um, next question. Oh, I'll take this one. Is the cost of testing being billed to families? If so, when will we see it? I don't want to be hit with a large bill at the end, especially when we're also asking for annual fund. And that's me. I'm guilty of asking for annual fund. <laughs> and sorry, I will continue to do that, but we won't hit you with the bill for testing for the rapid tests. Uh, we're covering those. Uh, so I appreciate that. And uh, if, if you want to chat, I'll be happy to, to talk with you uh, about the rapid tests and the school taking, taking that cost on. Um, really, we just bill for that initial test. Uh, at the beginning and then after that, the PCRs, the rapids, all of that we, we take care of as part of our costs, which increase, which is why we ask everyone to participate in the annual fund. Uh, but certainly that's a personal choice and everybody participates at a different level um, uh, that's meaningful to them. So certainly uh, not gonna hit you with a surprise bill for those tests. Um, yes, testing will continue. Repeat question on prom. I, I think we're we're done. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, thank you uh, to our medical team, especially. I know you're very busy and giving time already on the task force and, and on the medical calls. So thank you very much. Uh, and also to Jen, Raj, and Josh, uh, uh, Elise doing sort of duty on both sides. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, uh, if you have questions as parents or, or as students watching, uh, you know, use the resources. You can certainly reach out to me, your advisor. Or your child's advisor, uh, Mr. Joy and Mr. Bala, Ms. Viana, and we can answer your questions. Uh, but uh, I hope you have a good night. And again, thank you very much for joining.